an historic first television interview with the widow of John F. Kennedy's accused assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, Marina Oswald. Marina Oswald, a hard copy world exclusive. This is hard copy for Monday, November 19th, 1990. The torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born this century, tempered by war. From Dallas, Texas, good evening. I'm Barry Nolan. Not far from where I'm standing, the course of history was changed forever. With the squeeze of a trigger, Camelot was over and President John F. Kennedy was dead. It is an event which affected us all, including the woman you're about to meet tonight. For the first time ever in a serious sit-down interview, Marina Oswald, the wife of the alleged assassin, talks to the public. She's probably not what you expected, but she does have one thing in common with us all, that terrible memory. Where were you when you heard the news? Here's Mrs. Kennedy, the first lady stepping from the plane, wearing a bright pink suit with a dark fur color and a matching pink on the morning of Friday, November 22nd, Marina Oswald, a young Russian immigrant, sat with her two babies in Irving, Texas, and excitedly watched the arrival of America's president. When her friend, Ruth Payne, came home, Marina shared her enthusiasm, and then went to her bedroom to get dressed. 12.30 p.m., the fateful moment. Ruth runs to tell Marina that the president has been shot. The attack, they said, came from the Texas School Book Depository, the building where Marina's husband, Lee Harvey Oswald worked. Marina was worried. The previous spring, her husband had told her that he had shot at a local political figure. Marina and Lee had a bitter argument. My face flashed and I didn't want Ruth to, to witness that. So in order to compose myself, I just ran outside and I was just saying, please don't be, you know, late. you know, that's just a mistake of somewhat. Fearing the worst and knowing her husband had a rifle, Marina ran to the garage to see if the gun was still there. She breathed a sigh of relief. The blanket in which it had been wrapped seemed undisturbed. The blanket was there, so I kind of had a little bit of peace for that moment. Right. But when the police arrived, you know, I kind of felt that's it. You went to the garage again? No, so they asked me questions. Yeah. Does, you, does your husband possess, you know, rifle? And I was very embarrassed to admit this in front of Ruth Payne that she give us shelter and I harbor such a weapon. Yeah. And I said, yes. And that was embarrassing awful. So we went to the garage, I think. Then, I the moment of truth. A policeman picked up the blanket which had wrapped the rifle. The blanket sagged. Marina knew the gun was missing. The blanket was empty. And it was, I cannot describe the feeling. It was overwhelmingly shocking to think of what a horrible thing, crime, my husband might commit it. These people have given me a hearing without legal representation or anything. You shoot the president? I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. This was a very bad surprise for me. At breakfast time on that Friday, the biggest concern for 22-year-old Marina Oswald was taking care of her two kids here in this house in Irving, Texas, and dealing with a difficult new marriage. By lunchtime, she had heard the awful news from Dallas. And shortly after 3 o'clock that afternoon, when she left that driveway in a police car, this most unlikely of characters had been thrust into the spotlight in one of the most tragic dramas ever acted out on the stage of world events. A presidential commission headed by Chief Justice Earl Warren concluded that Oswald did it and did it alone. The name Oswald was permanently inscribed in history books. Killer, madman, Marxist. Marina, barely speaking English, just 22 years old, mother of two babies, became widow of presidential assassin. She knew Lee had a rifle, that he often behaved secretively, and based on the official evidence presented to her, Marina believed her husband was guilty. For years, she tried to fade into anonymity, rejecting various conspiracy theories. But now, with new information surfacing, Marina has changed her opinion completely. She's not only open to new theories, she's become convinced that her husband was framed. In her first full television interview, she speaks with Best Evidence author David Lifton. She re-examines her life with Lee Harvey Oswald. Marina's story began in war-torn Russia. She lost her mother at a young age, and her stepfather rejected her. 
but she was well read, and when she came of age, she enrolled in a pharmacy school. At 17, she moved to Minsk to live with a beloved aunt and her uncle, Colonel Ilya Prusikov, Colonel of the MVD, the equivalent of our FBI. When she was 19, Marina went to a dance, and her life was changed forever. My aunt pushed me out of the door. She said, boy, you spend only two and a half hours in front of the mirror. Don't you think you better go? I said, well, I don't want to go. So I went, and that's, uh, I'm not so, uh, I wasn't expecting to see Lee or any American for that matter. In a small town of Minsk, are you joking? His name was Lee Oswald. He was an American working in a radio factory in Minsk. Remember, if you see anybody suspicious, sit down beside another passenger. The little boy who loved adventure, international intrigue, and spy stories became the ex-Marine who traveled from Fort Worth to Moscow and said he wanted to live in Russia for the rest of his life. This was the man Marina met at the dance, whom she married six weeks later, who announced just weeks afterwards that he wanted to return to the United States with his bride. I compromised my relative's position and their well-being, choosing to go with my husband. I don't care what country that would have been. I didn't choose America for political reasons either. I married American because it was flattering that foreigners pay attention at me, and I thought so much of myself then. Meanwhile, in the United States, Kennedy was president. By the time Lee and Marina were granted exit visas from the Soviet Union, JFK had reached the midpoint of his thousand days. Within four months of his return to the U.S., Oswald is settled in Dallas and working in a photo lab that does government work. While Marina is tending to her baby, Lee is spending a great deal of time reading. There is also another side of Lee. He corresponds with four left-wing groups, including the Communist Party and Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Then, in March 1963, Lee orders a gun. April 10th, 1963, Marina's fears become reality. That night, he tells Marina that he used the rifle to shoot at retired General Edwin Walker, a prominent right-winger. We we'll have argument right away, how dare you? to take in your hands to take somebody's life. So he told me, he said, you don't know anything about politics and he's no good man. I said, that doesn't make uh, any difference at all. Um, and I told him if, if Hitler, no, he, sa he said to his excuse, he said, what would you say? Would that be honorable then if somebody killed Hitler with how many millions of lives will be saved. Yeah. Well, you cannot argue with that, but I tell him this is not the same situation. If you don't like somebody's political stand, you go through natural process of um, debating or right. changing the systems or persuading the people to look my theories better and things like that, the peaceful way. After the Walker incident, Lee took Marina to New Orleans, where he spent time handing out leaflets for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. He got in a fight, got arrested, and made the news. Then are you a Marxist? Well, I have uh, studied Marxist philosophy, yes, sir, and also other philosophers. But are you a Marxist? I think you did admit on an earlier radio interview that you, uh, that you consider yourself a Marxist. Oh, I would very definitely say that I, uh, I uh, am a Marxist. That is correct. But I, that does not mean, however, I'm a, a uh, communist. With Lee, it was always that emotional seesaw. You know, we do this and we go there. And just, I never knew what tomorrow will bring. One of the things that annoyed Marina about Lee Harvey Oswald was what she called his little boy games, his penchant for secrecy. For instance, during the last few weeks of his life, he lived here in this rooming house, and quite by accident, Marina discovered he was living here under an assumed name, O.H. Lee. But on Thursday, November 21st, the night before the assassination, Oswald's room here remained empty all night long. I didn't shoot anybody, sir. I haven't been told what I'm here for. Marina lives with the guilt of a widow who long ago condemned her husband as assassin and now believes he was wronged.